Hi, this is Miss Hadi from Olympian High School. We've been learning from the Traditions and Encounters textbook about World War II. We just finished uh, looking at um, the aggression that was done, per, uh, perpetrated by Japan towards China at the start of World War II. And now we're going to look at Italian and German aggression. So, uh, first of all, we should know that about the basic concept of fascism. And if you don't remember fascism, go back to the previous chapter and look at the interwar years, study fascism, um, and, and get to know it well, be familiar with it. You have um, Italy, a, a country that had suffered 600,000 deaths during World War I and um, really didn't feel like they got the recognition they deserved following World War I in the peace treaty, starting to um, take on expansionist measures. And we see that with the invasion of Ethiopia, with unnecessarily overwhelming force using poison gas and tanks and slaughtering over 200,000 Ethiopians. They also took over Libya and Albania. And we know that Benito Mussolini was good friends with Hitler, Adolf Hitler of, of Germany. And if you don't remember about Mussolini, you can go back to that previous chapter and refamiliarize yourself. So um, we start to see some of these revisionist aims to expand. Um, and it, it, Italy keeps the rest of Europe guessing until it eventually does join the Axis power. Um, and then the revisionist power that most revised the original terms of the agreement was Germany. As you know, Adolf Hitler had come to power in 1933. He withdrew Germany from the League of Nations and started to remilitarize Germany, which went against the original peace treaty of World War I. So for example, there was an area um, uh, called the Rhineland that he reoccupied, I believe it was 1935 or 36. And from there started to um, step by step, revise the terms of the uh, peace agreement by remilitarizing Germany. For example, in March of 1938, he made the claim that there were so many people living in a part of a country that no longer exists now called Czechoslovakia at the time. Now it's the Czech Republic and Slovakia. There were so many Germans living in a part of Czechoslovakia at that time, former Czechoslovakia, called the Sudetenland, that he argued that Germany had to... Um, take over this land in order to unite all of the German people. So using a nationalist argument to justify taking over this land, to have this Anschluss. Oh, I, actually, before I get into Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia, before that, he had an Anschluss union with Austria, again, citing their common cultural similarities. So first you have the Anschluss with Austria, and then putting pressure on the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, the area, the Sudetenland where a lot of Germans live. And you have the major powers of, of Europe, Britain and France, not really doing very much about this. Um, eventually, the major representatives of these powers meet in Germany in a place called Munich, the Munich Conference. So Italy, France, Great Britain and Germany meet where the allies agree to some of the things Hitler wanted. This becomes known as a policy of appeasement, conceding to the things that Hitler wanted on the hopes that this would prevent a war. So the idea is, you know, it's after the Great Depression, people are exhausted, nobody really wants war. Hitler, you know, faithlessly promises to halt any expansion. And um, the leader of Great Britain, the British Prime Minister, Nouvelle Chamberlain, goes home saying that they've created a peace for our time, peace for our time. So averting war, avoiding war um, by appeasing Hitler. This is not going to last. And in 1939, um, the Soviet Union, which is a communist country, and communists and fascists generally don't get along, the Soviet Union's leader, Joseph Stalin, signed a, an agreement which shocked the world. Because Joseph Stalin was convinced that the great powers were trying to deflect German aggression onto the Soviet Union, so they signed a non-aggression pact, basically saying that they wouldn't attack each other. Uh, and, and they also had a secret treaty that divided up Eastern Europe in the event of a war. So with the knowledge that the Soviet Union wasn't going to do anything in case of a war in terms of attacking Germany, this sets Germany up to really start World War II. Um, so he's going to expand into the rest of Czechoslovakia and take further steps from there. At this point, the uh, powers that had met at Munich are realizing that appeasement isn't going to work and they guarantee the security of Poland. And we'll get into what happens when Poland is invaded, but I'll have Mr. Hammond teach you about that. I do want to open the book and 
make sure um, that you guys capture some of the most important concepts. So um, this first paragraph talks about some of the suffering that Italy had and how they really felt like they were shut out of the division of the spoils of war after World War I. And then it talked, oh, I forgot to mention, I'm glad I opened the book. Really important for you to know about the Spanish Civil War. Your textbook does a terrible job. This is the one failing, one of the shortcomings of your book. They don't do such a good job teaching two things, mercantilism and the Spanish Civil War. So look up the Spanish Civil War on your own. One of my friends from graduate school, her entire thesis was about the Spanish Civil War. So the Spanish Civil War is fought, it depends on how you look at it. Was it a competition between fascists and communists? Was it a war over religion? People look at it in different ways, but I need you to know that that's where Italy and Germany practiced. Some people see it as like a training for World War II. So they were on the side of the fascists, the militarists during the Spanish Civil War, which was roughly 1936 to 1939. So you need to know about the Spanish Civil War. And as I mentioned, um, you know, this is very similar to what uh, Britain and France had done with Japanese aggress aggression towards China, which is not really do very much, you know, censure them, say that they should stop. And then both Japan and Germany ended up leaving the League of Nations. Okay, so um, this is telling you about, oh, Hitler blaming people for what had happened because the peace treaty of World War I was actually very harsh against Germany. And most of the Europeans realized that it was potentially too harsh. And Hitler would go around blaming communists and liberals and nearby countries. He called the signing of the peace agreement the November crime. Um, okay, and then telling you a little bit about Germany leaving the League of Nations, um, that his campaign of expansion ultimately leads to the outbreak of World War II. We learned about the Anschluss with Austria, and then we learned about appeasement uh, of Hitler when he occupied the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Uh, we know what appeasement means, you know, granting concessions. We talked about the Munich conference and how people were hoping it would avert war. And then we talked about that secret agreement between the Soviet Union and, um, and uh, Germany. And, you know, that part was unknown, but the, the non-aggression pact was known. Anyway, that sets up the stage for what's going to happen before the invasion of Poland by Germany.